Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. The reading that we've just had wasn't really the one that uh, I thought we'd have, but it doesn't matter at all, except for the fact that you'll see that what we're doing follows on rather from uh, the Revelation reading, which was chapter 18. But we're not going to go into that in any detail. So uh, let's begin. <coughs> Now, Christopher, what is that thing? Have you any ideas what it might be? What do you think it could be? Or perhaps somebody can whisper out loud. A trumpet. A trumpet. Well done. You've seen many trumpets, haven't you, in different times in the past, and probably carol services over Christmas on the television. But, um, of course, it is the trumpet that features very much in the book of Revelation. And it leads us to a very straightforward statement. And that is that the kingdom of the world, that is the kingdom that we know today, has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, that is of Jesus, and he will reign forever and ever. And some of those sentiments we've already touched upon, haven't we, as we've sung our opening hymns and as we reflected in prayer, looking to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to establish a kingdom on this world in place of the present arrangement of things. And the 18th chapter of Revelation speaks of the judgments that God will bring on the world of today. And it has a similar message, I suppose, to that which we read in Malachi, where the Lord would bring judgments upon those who are unfaithful, but would look to men and women of faith. And we read later that the time has come, this time in the future, for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, the people who revere your name, which is clearly what people in Malachi 1 were not doing because they were bringing whatever they thought to the Lord and nothing really mattered very much. A lack of reverence there, both great and small. So it's a time to look forward to. And of course, if we look through history, we will find that there have been lots and lots of occasions where God has judged this world and made a new beginning. There is a divine pattern. I may not have got it complete, but I've just taken some examples. We can all recall, can't we, the story of Noah, when the world was flooded, and all the men and women, save Noah and his family, all the men and women of that age perished. <coughs> it didn't necessarily mean that all were without hope in the future who preceded that, but at that time, God's judgment was such that only that family was saved. And then we have the judgment on the Canaanite civilization. Some people say, wasn't it terrible of God to have, you know, brought the Jews into this land and killed all the other people? And how could it ever be? Well, first of all, it wasn't the first time that God had saved his people at the expense of judging others. But also the record in Genesis reminds us when we think about this time that God didn't act immediately because the wickedness of the Canaanite population was not sufficient to justify his destruction of the civilization at that time. We read that in the early chapters of Genesis. But the time came when the Canaanite civilization was judged and the judgment was brought about by God in the establishment of uh, his own people in the land he had promised them. And the cycle repeats itself and repeats itself. Sorry, I've gone too far forward. We've got the judgment of Israel and Judah. We only have to think of the way in which those two uh, nations, although they were one in one sense, but they met their end too. The Lord Jesus Christ coming and bringing judgments upon a world which appeared to follow God, but which was full of Judaistic ritual people um, setting their own rules, doing their own things, saying what pleased God, what didn't please God, a sort of power structure. <coughs> Jesus spoke very critically of that 
and spoke and foretold its destruction in AD 70. And then, of course, we shouldn't be surprised, should we, to find that history, in a sense, uh, repeats itself and there will be a time when there will be a judgment upon this Gentile world which our Revelation reading speaks of. And yet if you look at the top of this slide you will see that in each case uh, there are people who were saved through the difficulties and the tribulations and the circumstances of that civilization or society that met with God's judgments. And if you think of those who lived before Noah, we are told, we are actually told by name of Abel, Enoch, and Noah himself, and possibly others, who ultimately will be brought into, or are a part of, as it were, the eternal purpose of God. So the judgment upon a society doesn't necessarily mean the end for individuals within it. And then you think of the Canaanite civilization, where Rahab and her family were saved, and where Lot uh, was saved with his daughters too. So when we think about the judgments of God, we need to recognize that there is hope uh, for the future. And the same has been true for all the faithful in God or in the Lord Jesus Christ down the ages. But we are told clearly that although each of these individual people were commended for their faith, and those that are particularly commended are those named in this chapter, none of them received what God had promised, because God had planned something better for each one of us. That together, only together with us, would they be made perfect. So the time is coming when those who have walked before the Lord in the way he would have them walk and revered his name will be brought together in that kingdom age. So it's something we look forward to. Now, what have we got here? What does that look like? Any offers? It looks like a scroll, and indeed it is a scroll. And it is sealed, but of course the seals are taken off in Revelation, and each of those people, and the faithful of this generation too, are told that they will be part of this kingdom. They will be priests to serve our God. So speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're worthy to take the scroll and to open it. And inside, we find a message for the faithful of all ages, that they should be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. This man looks as if he has what? Worry. A problem. Worries a lot on his mind. He's certainly thinking about something. He's actually trying to answer this question. So what is it that determines the way we live today? What makes us take one course of action in our lives or another? Any ideas? What might make us take one course of action rather than another? We want to do rather than we do. Right, we may wish to think, I want this, but of course the question goes further and saying, why do I want this? But yes, it may be ourselves personally. Any other ideas? What I mean, we're making decisions all the time. What influences them? What other people want. What other people want sometimes, yes. And that can be very, very powerful in, in the working life especially, as well as probably in the family environment, doing things that other people want. It may be tradition. It may be simply we've always done something one way. <coughs> when you start to analyse it, there are lots of different ways. There's a donkey there and a stick and a carrot. What does that speak of? Come on, you know. Reward or punishment. If I do this, it'll work out well for me. If I don't do it, it'll be neck on the block. What about this one? One arrow is in the middle, and one arrow is on the edge. Perhaps we do something I would suggest, and you can reflect on this later, as to whether or not we think it's going to be successful. If we think we're going to miss the board, we're not likely to fire the arrow. Of course, I don't play darts. But if we know we're going to hit the middle one, we'll say, right, I'll have a game. So, you know, think about that generally in your life. <clears throat> then this risk. How many of us... Um, think about the risks of things and it's the perception of risk, it's not even the real risk there are many people that say, I can't go out now it's half past four and it's dark 
but actually they're safe at half past four, so at half past three, statistically. Other people say, I won't ride a bike in London. And yet they're safer riding a bike than walking on the pavement. Because, of course, the news sways perspectives. So risk is something. We think, well, <laughs> is it a good idea? And sometimes it's not the real risk, but the perception of it. This one links to Claire's comments about what other people want. These are the people we hang out with. Sometimes they will say, let's do something, when actually we would prefer to do something else, but we go <coughs> along with them. But the one I want you to spend a few moments for you to really to reflect upon is actually our perspective about what the future may hold. Now all of these obviously are linked together because the future might involve issues of reward or punishment, success or failure. But the idea about what the future may hold, and so when we start to think about the huge number of visions that are presented to us in the Bible, some of them relatively clear and spelled out, and others somewhat more mysterious and perhaps painting pictures for us to sort of get our imagination around, how we hold on to and how we value those things will influence the way that we choose to live and the activities that we do. Tell me what's going on in the top two pictures. And I'm not going through all of these, I'll leave you time to think of these when you get a copy of it. Well, what are the top two pictures about? Can you see one or the other? Christopher, what's that thing on that side here on the right? Here, what's this thing? <coughs> Tea. It is. It's a teacup and they're the tea leaves and some people will read the tea leaves to find out what the future is going to be and other people will consult a crystal ball. But what I'm saying is that we need to think because what we think about the future, how secure we believe God's promises to be, um, the visions that we have about the future globally and personally will affect the way we behave. You could look at any of these, I don't know which one you've lighted on, but suppose we took D for example. You know there are no traffic police around um, and uh, you know you're, you're going home from the meeting and you know you're perhaps the dinner's well doing and you think well I've got to get home quickly. If you know there's no traffic police around there is the possibility that you might go faster than the speed limit at least once. Yeah? I mean you might even chance it if you think they are. You might think well I know where they probably normally hang out. But what we think will influence, if we knew we were going to be caught for exceeding the speed limit on the way home because the potatoes might burn, we would not do it. So it's a simple scenario, but it's an important one to hold in our mind because what we think about the future influences exactly the decisions that we make now. I'm not going through all of these, I have no intention. I've put them here for you to explore, to think about if you wish at some later stage the PowerPoint is available. But we don't need tea leaves, do we? And we don't need crystal balls because we have God's Word, the Bible. And wherever you go through, and I've tried to pick here examples in each of the sort of historic periods that are started with, of things that God has said and that have happened. I will wipe away the human race whom I've created from the face of the earth. God says at the time he brings judgments upon the world of Noah's day and lo and behold it happens or you can look further to Daniel for example I mean, look at them all by all means but look at Daniel here who is uh, telling us there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he's shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come and they were days that came immediately and they happened to Nebuchadnezzar and you can read about it and they were also about more distant days what about the Acts here, where Paul is able to say that not one of you will perish? They've been in this terrible shipwreck, been at sea. We know how terrible it is to be at sea, don't we, Pauline, for any time. When you've been at sea for 14 days or whatever it was, and you've scarcely seen the day or the night, and that you're buffeted on every side, somebody's able to say, every single one of you will get to the shore safely, all 276. And lo and behold, it happened. So we have a very sure word that talks about the future, that we need to put confidence in. We're thinking about the future, aren't we? As we move to 2014, Dennis has mentioned that in his prayer, looking to the time, perhaps even, of the fulfilment <coughs> of the promises and God's judgment upon the civilization of today. And bringing us right up, of course, to Revelation, which is where our minds uh, sort, of, sort of started and the centre of the present 
a revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show what must soon take place. There's no example where we can go to the scripture and, and, and disprove anything that God has said. But page after page we are absolutely full of the surety of God's word. And so when God said to Abraham, a man of great faith, I will establish my covenant <coughs> as an everlasting covenant. We've come to remember that covenant this morning. It's on the table in bread and wine. He's, he has established it. He will establish it. It is fixed. For Abraham, the land is to be given to him as an everlasting possession. In the same way as Paul says in Romans, that the world is the eternal blessing of all those who are the children of Abraham. That the <coughs> descendants would be blessed after him. And through his offspring, through the Lord Jesus Christ, his seed, we're told this very clearly in the New Testament what this passage means, through your offspring, all nations throughout this world will be blessed. Individuals within those nations at different times and eternally, and ultimately a blessing which some may not yet recognise as a blessing, but an ultimate blessing when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ brings us into this promise that we are sons and daughters of God through faith. Well known things. But if we're sure of who we are and what's going to come, then we'll be moving in the right direction, I'm sure, throughout these coming uh, days. Anyone I any idea what that picture is of? Yes, exactly. A time of peace. I don't know whether this will play because we're having problems with feedback. So there we are, just a, a little song, a little uh, section from the prophets, which again you will be able to follow perhaps more fully if we didn't have the feedback situation we've got this morning. But the picture of the kingdom to come, the time of peace when the swords and the warfare of the present day um, are turned into time of peace, that's what our opening hymn was about, wasn't it? Two thousand years have rolled on, man at war with man hears not the words of peace they bring. But there's certain words of peace. Here, what's this picture about? It's coming from Isaiah. Exactly. Good. We've got the wild animals, presumably the wolf there, and the lamb, and that's a most bizarre picture. And yet these pictures are painted for us to know of this time to come. And to have, you know, have it as an assurity. We may not be able to interpret exactly what is meant by every vision but they all tie up to a wonderful future. What about this one? This, this is the significant thing, this blue line. Yes, it's, it's a river. It comes from Isaiah, where in the desert, the wilderness and the, and the dry place will be glad because there will be water in the desert. And how wonderful that will be for so many people who are limited. We, we're not limited by water, we know that all the time, but people are limited by water. Now, literally that, I imagine, to be <coughs> something that we will see fulfilled, a wonderful time of restitution of the, the, the sort of productivity of the earth. But these are pictures of the future age of prosperity. A rather similar one here, of course, this time being the lion and the lamb, that's coming from the 65th chapter of Isaiah, and then the picture of the new heavens and the new earth in the 66th. So we've got this wonderful idea of a new heavens and a new earth, and we'll come back to that shortly. I'm not going to put the music section on with that because of the feedback this morning. And so, above all, we look to this time then, don't we, when God shall wipe away all tears from our <laughs> eyes. The sadnesses that we have, and we all have sadnesses, and we may choose not to talk about them, but if we actually sat down and thought about them, we will have sadnesses. 
the tears, the sadness of this present day and age will go. We are all bound, as Dennis said in his prayer, by mortality, and uh, there shall be no more death. There shall be no sorrow. There shall be no crying. No more pain. Think of the pain that people suffer. And think about the pain that we individually suffer from time to time. It may be emotional pain. It may not be physical pain. It may be pain on behalf of other people. It may be pain when we read the newspapers. It may be pain when we consider the situation in Syria. All of these things shall disappear and the new age will come. And if we can really keep this in our um, minds, we'll be looking to this time with eagerness rather than just having these, as it were, as prophetic words um, that don't impact on the way we live from minute to minute. And we read in Revelation that uh, the Lord Jesus says, I am making everything new. And write this down, for these words of mine are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the beginning and the end. And to those who thirst for these things, who thirst for the Lord Jesus and for the living God, I will give these things without price those who are victorious, each one of us victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ, will inherit all this. It's not may inherit it, could inherit it, if we're lucky we'll inherit it. It is a firm and established promise. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. What a wonderful picture of the time to come. So, let's start to bring a few things together. Who is this here. I wonder if anybody's got any ideas who this might be. Well, yes, it could be Abraham. Who do you think it is, Chris? Who's this? Who do you think it is? I can see Claire's trying to tease Christopher <laughs> suggest it might be Father Christmas. Well, the truth is, we don't know what Abraham looked like, do we? But the stars, of course, there uh, are put there, I suppose, that we can consider that each one of us, as it were, a star in that uh, kingdom age to come. The promises uh, made to Abraham. And there's Abraham. And what did God require? Well, he said to Abraham, this covenant is about faithfulness and walking blamelessly and that's what he wanted of Abraham it was fairly simple that he should walk in faith and he should be blameless now if Abraham had not believed the things that were promised to him and he thought it was all a load of fairy tale and a load of old rubbish would he have lived the life he lived before his God? But because he was sure of what was going to happen, he had every good reason to walk faithfully and blamelessly before God. But what about ourselves? This comes from Peter. But in keeping with his promise, we, brothers and sisters, children, of, of, of our Heavenly Father are looking forward to a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells the one the trumpets ushered in that's what we're looking forward to and we know it's going to happen and so he says what does it mean for us where is our exaltation what is it that we're about in the coming year simple isn't it make every effort so we have to do something it's not all done for us that's not that the Lord isn't here to help, assist, to intervene, to be with us. But we have to make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, same word actually, isn't it? Blameless again, and at peace with him. So we have a responsibility, if we're going to be at peace with him, to walk faithfully before him, to reverence his name, and so on. My last little picture, it's a picture of what? Do you, what do you think this is a picture of? Any ideas? Who do you think might be represented in the picture? Jesus, yes. Again, we don't know what Jesus looked like. But this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ 
coming back to the earth and we know in Acts don't we that Jesus would come back in exactly the same way he left we're under no illusions that this will happen the question is if we believe it how does it impact on our life in the coming year and Jesus himself says look I am coming soon my reward is with me and I'll give to each person according to what they have done according to the way in which they've lived their lives whether in fact they have been faithful to the covenant promise that has been brought to them so in this coming year each one of us is simply asked to reflect on two simple things how confident are we in that which has been promised us and if we are confident and if we say yes we are confident where is the evidence of that confidence in our lives because in the Lord Jesus Christ when we think about the things that determine the future there's no risk these promises are secure there's no punishment for we are forgiven our sins by the Lord Jesus Christ the future is actually an opportunity to redeem the past and the certainty of the future is something that should help us in our walk in the present.